Choosing a game controller is a very personal thing. Everyone has different preferences for what they look for when it comes to their primary tool for playing games. For Try and I, we've almost always preferred to use first-party controllers created by the console manufacturers themselves. They always just felt so much more robust and better built. What can I say? It takes a lot to stand up next to the perfection of the original SNES controller or the freaking Japanese Saturn pad. But seriously, there's been plenty of standouts over the years. Whether they're known for the right reasons can be debatable. So let's take a look at some amazing, weird, unique, and uh, not so hot third-party controllers that have been released over the years. Party controllers have always been something that, as a general rule, I've tried to avoid. But at least one company has been able to build enough trust and clout to always pique my interest when they show up with new accessories. Hori has long been the king of third-party controllers and devices for gaming in Japan, oftentimes even with official licensing from the console manufacturers, lending to an extremely authentic look and feel. Perhaps Hori's most famous controller is the digital controller for GameCube. So named for its prominently featured D-pad and lack of analog functionality, the digital controller was such a popular import in the early 2000s that for Western gamers it became synonymous with the Hori brand, earning its generic moniker, the Hori Pad. For a long time, we believed that the Hori Pad was available only as an import, but this box appears to be from what must have been a very limited American release branded as the Game Boy Player Controller. And certainly that is its most obvious application. The GameCube controller's critical flaw is that it possesses perhaps the only widely maligned D-pad that Nintendo has ever created. Whether you choose to use the analog stick or the tiny out of reach D-pad, Game Boy games are simply not as fun with a standard controller. Today, we've luckily got homebrew software called Game Boy Interface, which can be loaded via a combination of SD media loaders and action replay discs, among other methods. This unlocks the potential of the Game Boy hardware within the Game Boy Player, greatly optimizing the video output over Nintendo's official boot disc, and improving input lag. In combination with the Hori Pad, there are few better ways to enjoy Game Boy Color or Game Boy Advance games on real hardware, if you ask me. The D-pad is virtually on par with Nintendo's own controllers, and as for the buttons, I have no reason to believe they aren't Nintendo's OEM parts. The GameCube's strange Z button becomes a comfortable face button for occasional use, while the select button, which normally doesn't exist on a GameCube, is just a duplicate Y input. But the Hori Pad is not just a Game Boy controller. Any GameCube game that does not require the analog stick for movement, analog shoulder buttons, or the C stick can be played with the Hori Pad. While that may be a pretty limited selection, it's pure bliss for the games that do work with it. I'll be honest, the Hori Pad just might be my favorite controller of all time, at least in theory. While its uses may be somewhat limited, it combines the simple perfection of the timeless Super Nintendo controller with what is, in my opinion, a superior button configuration to the standard diamond layout. While the GameCube controller can be a bit divisive, I really think Nintendo has a smart thing going with the large central A button, granting quick access to any other button, and making more simultaneous button combinations possible compared to a diamond layout. I've been lucky enough to have owned my Hori Pad since the days when you could readily import a new one, but unfortunately, much like the GameCube component cables, it's a much coveted rarity these days, with used controllers being resold at well over $100. To me, it's essential, but others might want to first look to adapters for playing the Game Boy Player with SNES or PS1 controllers instead. I think for a lot of people in the West, the GameCube Hori Pad was what made us aware of Hori in the first place and immediately established them as the go-to brand for alternative controllers. But their history in Japan goes much further back, and not all of their products are officially licensed. When I got into the PC Engine slash Turbo Graphics scene relatively recently, I quickly found far more games to enjoy for the platform than I ever expected. But something about the D-pad of the regular controllers felt just a bit off to me. Maybe I didn't give it enough of a chance, but I soon started to look for alternatives. 
That's what led me to discover the Hori Fighting Commander line, a series of controllers that appears to have begun in the 16-bit generation, with new iterations to this day for PS4, Xbox One, and even Super Nintendo Classic Edition. The obvious intent of the Fighting Commanders is to provide a button pattern that mimics an arcade layout for advanced fighting game control. This is the Hori Fighting Commander PC, a version for the PC Engine that is not officially licensed as far as I can tell. Now, I'm generally not at all a fighting game fan, and as best I can tell, extremely few games have special functions for controllers with more than two main face buttons. To ensure compatibility with regular two-button PC Engine titles, the rightmost toggle should be in the 2B position. So yeah, this controller is definitely overkill for me, but the D-pad appears to be virtually identical to the GameCube Hori pad, so I knew I'd love it. The 1 and 2 buttons are rather far to the edge of the controller, but generally this isn't a problem, and I like how they're aligned side by side, just like on a regular controller. The SNES style shape of the body and the start and select buttons may not have the characteristic PC Engine controller feel, but they are comfortable. The cord is a bit longer than a standard PC Engine controller, although I still have to use an extension if I'm playing on my couch. I believe the Hori Commander should work on a TurboGrafx if adapted, but I don't have the means to verify it for sure. I certainly don't think standard PC Engine controllers are bad, but given the enjoyment I've gotten out of the system so far, I think 42 bucks was worth it for a familiar feeling D-pad. Unfortunately, prices tend to be closer to $50 to $65 lately, but at least it's not as pricey as some of Hori's more sought-after controllers. It's true, Hori is pretty great. For my money, I'd say that they're the best third-party peripheral manufacturer out there. The Hori GameCube pad is a treasured controller in my collection, even though I did pay a hefty price for it, even years ago. Playing Ikaruga with it is perfect. Next, let's take a look at some of Hori's newer offerings. The mini wired gamepad for the PlayStation 4 is a controller that's geared primarily towards younger players with its smaller size and brightly colored appearance. Despite being made and marketed for kids, I feel like this controller has been criminally misunderstood. Of course, there's a number of obvious problems with this controller. The cheap feeling analog sticks without any kind of rubber coating to prevent slipping aren't meant for games that make heavy use of them. This tiny square button has the same functionality as clicking the touchpad. But as far as I can tell, there's no way to actually click both sides of the touchpad, which limits performance in a chunk of games. On top of that, if you need real touch interaction, there's a number of time-consuming button presses involved, and then you have to make use of the analog sticks to simulate finger dragging. A lack of rumble or motion controls further hinders usability, but you probably weren't expecting it anyways based on the last two negative points. So yeah, there's a ton of games that you probably don't want to use this controller with, but you know what? It's a pretty good choice when it comes to the 2D, retro-style games on the PS4, and those are plentiful. The classic form factor of this pad feels almost akin to the Super NES controller, although it's a bit thicker. This thing probably could have existed in 1990, and been fairly popular. It's smooth and heavy duty, and the D-pad is tight and effortless. I do kind of wish that there was a bit more traction or rougher plastic use on the D-pad itself though, because it can feel a bit slippery at times. Although it might seem a bit blasphemous to even consider playing with a pad instead of a fight stick, I found this pad to be great for fighting games. The digital shoulder buttons, with their immediate response, are a much better choice for this kind of game, versus the normal triggers on a DualShock 4, because there isn't nearly as much travel distance. However, if a game makes heavy use of the L1 and R1 buttons, well, those are a bit small for my tastes. As the name states, this controller is wired, but it has a decently long 10-foot cable. It still works on the PlayStation 3, in so much as a normal DualShock will, meaning that the PS button won't work at all. That's kind of a deal breaker. Arcade action, shooters, platformers, these are the kind of games that this controller was meant to be used with, and I think that a lot of critics of this pad are overlooking it. It's unfortunate that Hori didn't play up that angle instead, marketing it as a retro game controller instead of a kid's controller. As such, this controller has been clearanced out in a lot of places, which is how I got mine. It's difficult to say whether or not this will become a sought-after pad in the future. It's not for everyone. 
but understand what you're getting and what it can be used for. Maybe Hori can make some tweaks to the overall design and bring out a pad dedicated to the ample throwback style games on the PS4. But for now, this'll do just nicely. When I was in college, I remember a bit of controversy surrounding the PlayStation 1 game Thrill Kill that was basically an ultra-explicit four-player pit fighter. Due to the adult nature of the game, it was ultimately cancelled at the last minute despite being basically finished. However, developer Paradox Entertainment wasn't about to let that engine go to waste, and with the help of Activision, they are able to utilize it in Wu-Tang Shaolin style which played similarly but had the star power of the Wu-Tang Clan. Out of the doorway, bullets, ripple, clip, guard speed, approach, follow Included with a special edition of the game was this legendary controller, the Wu-Tang W controller for PS1, which might just be the most ridiculous pad I've ever laid my eyes on. Thanks to our friend Drew Literal, I'm able to check out this controller as well as many others in this episode. Shaped like the W insignia of the Wu-Tang Clan, this PS1 pad is mostly ridiculed due to its absurd nature. Let me tell you, this thing is neither comfortable nor easy to use, making it more of a conversation piece than anything. The W controller's black and yellow color scheme is pretty unique and it feels solidly built. Unfortunately, the overall size is completely unwieldy. This thing comes close to matching the dimensions of the original Xbox Duke. Most notably is the lack of any kind of analog stick, but also it's missing any sort of rumble features which means that this thing is basically a big hunk of plastic. The D-pad mixes standard PS1 style directional keys with diagonal connections. Unfortunately, it plays just as bad as it looks. I put that to the test along with its sorta of oval shaped buttons with Street Fighter Alpha 2 Gold, and the results weren't pretty. But it was the shoulder buttons that were a bit more challenging than I expected. I know, I know, they had a very, very specific form factor to work with here, but dang, these are pretty tough to use. If for some reason you feel determined enough to use this controller for real, actual gameplay, I try to stick with games that don't make use of any of the shoulder buttons. But as I said, this pad is more of a novelty for fans of the Wu-Tang Clan than anything else. And in that respect, I guess it's a pretty cool collector's item. The Super Nintendo controller is a nearly perfect balance of comfort, simplicity, and just enough buttons to let you do a lot without the controls getting too overwhelming. But in spite of that basic purity, it's continued to be strangely difficult to find a suitable third-party replacement. But there was one alternative controller from back in the day that did manage to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the original. The ASCII pad was my personal introduction to turbo controllers, and to this day, I still prefer the toggle switch design over programmable turbo buttons. But what good is turbo if the rest of the controller isn't satisfying to use? Well, the ASCII pad is an officially licensed controller, so similar to many of Hori's offerings, ASCIiWare must have had access to a lot of Nintendo's resources. The Super Famicom styled buttons are always appealing, and I'm sure they're authentic Nintendo parts, and the D-pad also seems to be just as good. The thickness and overall shape seems to be virtually identical to Nintendo's controllers, being an almost imperceptible bit wider. The biggest difference, of course, is the upward slope of the shoulder buttons, which gives space for the turbo toggles and actually works quite comfortably. The ASCII pad just gets it right. It's so perfect it's almost boring. What more is there to say? This is the turbo controller to get for the SNES. If you're looking for newer offerings and are keeping a low retro gaming budget, online retailer Castlemania Games sent us the SNES Scout and NES Cadet by Hyperkin. These are wired controllers that sell brand new for about $12 to $15. The SNES Scout does seem a bit better than your average knockoff controller. It doesn't try to exactly mimic the Nintendo feel, but the buttons are kinda okay. They have a little bit more click to them than real SNES controllers if you're into that. 
A slightly rounded back is a nice touch that gives your middle fingers a perfect groove to rest in. Now that's all well and good, but this particular controller that we were sent is constantly registering an L button press. I discovered it when Tetris Attack turned out to be completely impossible to play due to the puzzle floor being constantly forced up. And in Mario Kart, I couldn't even jump at all. I have no idea how widespread this problem could be, and opening the controller to adjust the shoulder pads didn't change anything. I'm sure it's a decent enough controller for those that do work, but I certainly can't ever use this one. After that experience, I wasn't expecting much from the NES Cadet. From a design perspective, it's very faithful to the layout of original NES rectangles, which is the good and proper way for an NES controller to be. I just don't really understand people who say that the NES controller's 90 degree corner somehow dig into their hands, but for them, Hyperkin has angled off the lower edges, so this should not be a problem for anyone. In addition, the curve on the back of the SNES Scout is here too, and I do have to admit, this is one comfy NES controller. And you know what? It plays pretty great. I had no problem with any buttons registering, and even the D-pad performs excellently, with no trouble responding correctly to cardinal directions or diagonals. My only two complaints are that the D-pad, at least on this unit, makes a slightly loud popping sound, and that the fit in the controller port is far too tight for my liking. But overall, consider me surprised. This is a solid budget alternative to official NES controllers, and one that I could actually see some people preferring over the real thing. But there was one other Hyperkin controller in the box from Castlemania that immediately piqued my interest, the HyperClick Retro Style Mouse. The SNES mouse is certainly one official input device for the system that could stand to have a modern update. It's quite small, and the dirt and gunk prone rubber ball style tracking control is a design that I imagine absolutely no one wants to see make a comeback. Upon taking the HyperClick out of the box, my first impression was that it's somewhat large, larger than I was expecting, but I suppose the target market is, after all, nostalgic folks whose hands have grown since 1992. It also has a sharp semi angular slope toward the front end with the buttons. But the key thing is on the underside. This is an optical mouse. Not exactly a surprise in this day and age, but it's an extremely welcome update. And it's immediately obvious, this controls so much more smoothly than the official Nintendo mouse, even when the insides are clean. I don't think it's guaranteed to make your Mario Paint artwork any better, but I don't know, I think I'm seeing some results here. And I always enjoy a good round of the Mario Paint Flyswatter game. While I was worried about the shape of the HyperClick mouse at first, once I started using it, I remembered that I'm not exactly picky when it comes to mouse design, but I'm not sure how those who are more sensitive to unergonomic mouse designs will feel about it. $20 is not a bad price, but it still might be a bit much for most people's Mario Paint nostalgia fix. But there are a few other games that support the SNES mouse. For me, I've still yet to play through Mario and Wario and Wonder Project J for the Super Famicom. And I can absolutely say without a doubt that when I get around to properly starting those games, I'll be pulling out the HyperClick instead of the official maps. In the history of third-party peripheral makers, a tip of the hat has to be given to Mad Cats. It's actually pretty impressive just how much this company released in their lifetime, with the fifth and sixth console generations being their most prolific and experimental. I was honestly never much of a fan but let's see if my mind can be changed. The Retrocon for the PS1 and PS2 is a 2002 control pad that seems right up my alley. Of all the Mad Cats controllers I've seen over the years, I was the most interested and excited to check this one out. The name of the pad is Apt, the design harkening back to the purely square design of the NES and Master System controllers. Filed under unnecessary, is the small LEDs that light up inside the pad, giving it a subtle glow when it's plugged in. Holding down Start and Select for a few seconds enables Analog Mode, which lights up the Mad Cat's logo in bright red. The back of the pad has a rubber coating to prevent slippage for those with sweaty hands. Because the controller is used for both PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2, it includes a set of analog sticks. Interestingly, when in digital mode, which you'll find yourself using for many of the PS1 era games, the sticks still work replicating the digital functionality of each side of the controller. The left stick is for the D-pad, 
and the right is for the cross layout of the buttons, meaning pressing up is for triangle, down is X, left is square, and right is circle. This was kind of an inspired choice and works pretty well for twin stick shooters on the PS1 that use the button layout in place of a second stick, before the invention of the DualShock. Other kinds of games though? I don't know if it works all that well. For PS2 games, the analog sticks work as they normally would. Despite my high hopes, I was pretty let down by the RetroCon's functionality for retro games. The D-pad is incredibly mushy, lacking any kind of central pivot. This seems like a huge oversight, especially for a pad that is so heavily pitched to be used in 2D games. The shoulder buttons are also a bit tricky. Instead of having two sets of buttons stacked on top of each other, the RetroCon splits each shoulder button in half, making each side so tiny that they're kind of unusable in the heat of the moment. Naturally, concessions had to be made to stick with the overall vision of the controller, but it's best to stay away from games that make heavy use of the shoulder buttons. The RetroCon had a ton of potential, but it was kind of a disappointment overall to me. Perhaps it was Sewn at Mad Cat's pet project, so it didn't have the R&D and funding to reach its ultimate goal. On the Nintendo 64, we have the digital and analog arcade joystick, which combines a flight stick and a fight stick into one truly monstrous unit. I was surprised to find that the joystick uses micro switches, which wasn't too common at the time. The button layout was made for arcade fighters, but I couldn't get the up and right C buttons to work right, as you can see by me just getting wrecked in Mortal Kombat Trilogy. I'm not sure if this was a problem with the controller or just some sort of weird incompatibility. That's fine though, because most people would want this thing for the flight stick anyways. Because Star Fox 64, right? This analog flight stick has a trigger, A and B buttons, and a hat switch, which serves as a C button. There's also a button on the grip itself. My dreams of an amazing Star Fox 64 experience were quickly dashed once I found that the trigger is tied to the Z button. Which I guess makes sense, but for games like this, it means that it'll be used to do a barrel roll hardly intuitive or natural. This is a little bit better in pilot wings using the gyrocopters, but I can't help but feel like the overall stick would have been benefited by putting the A button on the trigger. A simple fix that would have made sense for the games that people really wanted to use this thing with. Another ridiculous N64 pad is the Boomerang 64 from Nubi. Or is that nubby? I don't know. Talk about unwieldy, right? Shaped like a boomerang, this is without a doubt one of the dumbest looking controllers I've ever seen. I guess they had an idea in their head and just went for it. My initial impressions were pretty positive. It feels surprisingly good in your hands. A bit more spacious than the original controller, although I'm not sure how well it holds up over extended use. The placement of the face buttons felt natural, although the C buttons were the exact same size as A and B, which might throw your muscle memory for a loop if you're used to the smaller than normal buttons on the default controller. The analog stick felt a bit more robust than the original, although the plastic enclosure had come loose, which made it slip and slide a bit more than I would have liked. I'm not sure if this is how it's supposed to be, or if it's just from wear and tear. The digital pad is a bit lower on the wing, making it feel a bit more lopsided in practice. But, as you know, there's not many games that use the D-pad exclusively anyways, so this isn't a major issue. For games like Kirby or Mischief Makers, I think I'd just stick with the original Nintendo 64 controller. There's a Z button on each wing of the boomerang. The L and R buttons are on these tiny little circles you press with your middle finger. Which kind of feels awkward in practice. Although, to be honest, I'm not really sure if there's any other way they could have done it with this design. Probably the most surprising aspect of this pad is that it has built-in rumble via motors on each of the wings. You just need a couple of AAA batteries and you're good to go. Of course, the original rumble pack is always an option as well. I'll admit, 
I'm a known defender of the N64 controller. I was just 13 when the system released and it felt like such an amazing time to be alive. Even then, I realized I was living through a moment in history, interacting with 3D software that would chart the course for the future of gaming. And to me, this controller felt like the perfect tool for exploring the new frontier. When well-maintained, the N64 stick has an incredible responsiveness and range of movement, although its durability is certainly a major concern. The D-pad is among the finest Nintendo has ever made, but is seldom used, and the face button layout is an acquired taste. Some people just can't get over the tri-prong design, and I just don't see why it's such a big deal. All the same, many third-party controllers over the years have sought to capitalize on the natural revulsion that many seem to have toward the official N64 controller. On Christmas of 1996, the day I got my own N64, a family member gave a well-intentioned gift of a second controller, the SuperPad 64 Plus by Interact. I politely smiled and proceeded to basically never use it. You think the N64 controller is weird, while well, I just couldn't get over the grotesque difference in size between the two handles, the off-angle analog stick, wide button spread, and what is the deal with this tiny middle finger position Z button? I try to keep my middle finger out of my video games, thank you very much. I thought this thing was a total joke, and I only ever used it on rare occasions when I needed the turbo function to supplement my paltry button mashing skills. But in recent years, a number of people have told me that this is actually their preferred go-to N64 controller. What? I, I just couldn't believe it. So for this episode, I've revisited the SuperPad 64 Plus, equipped with the newfound knowledge that this is in fact a controller that is possible for people to like, even love. And, you know, giving it just a few minutes with a fresh perspective, I can't believe I'm saying this, but maybe I've been a bit unfair to this misshapen blob of a controller for all these years. The buttons feel fine, and the spacing is probably meant to mimic a Sega or arcade layout, which, while not my preference, I can see what they were going for. The shoulder buttons are quite good, but I still just can't get into the Z button. Guess I don't exercise my middle finger enough. And you know, the stick, which works at a slight angle, well, it's still a bit weird, but I can see how you could get used to it. It's not that bad, and it even has a hybrid plastic metal shaft, so it seems pretty durable, although it's hard to say since this controller has been so lightly used. But I've walked away from the SuperPad 64 Plus with newfound respect. I never thought I would say that. As long as my real N64 controllers are alive and well, I can't see myself ever choosing to use it, but for all of you who do prefer it, carry on. Anything that helps you enjoy the wonders of the N64 is a good thing in my book. But what happens if longtime N64 fans were to take modern controller design and marry it with the original N64 controller? That's the idea behind the Brawler 64 gamepad by Retro Fighters. Funded by a successful Kickstarter campaign in the summer of 2017, the Brawler 64 was highly anticipated as a potential total replacement for worn down N64 controllers. But upon its release, widespread reports of L button and analog stick issues put a damper on the hype. Thankfully, revisions were made and that's what we've got our hands on here today, a current model of the Brawler 64 sent to us by Castlemania Games. Now, you know how I feel about the N64 controller, and I knew it was unlikely that I would ever choose to use this controller over the one that I know and love so well. So that's why I decided to play through Bomberman Hero with the Brawler 64, a game that I had never previously touched while using an actual N64 controller. I thought it would be good to play a game that I had no previous expectations for how it should feel and play, and within a couple of hours, the controller had melded into my hands and I wasn't even thinking about it all anymore. My biggest concern when I first took the Brawler 64 out of the box was the smooth capped rubber stick. The convex design is most comparable in size and style to an older DualShock, which is by no means a bad thing, but it definitely has less texture and grip. In practice though, I was surprised by how well it works. I've really had no problems keeping my thumb on the stick at all. Super Mario 64 is of course one of the better tests of analog stick sensitivity, with Mario having so many more degrees of speed and movement than pretty much any other game character ever. 
I didn't have much trouble putting Mario through all his paces, and movement mostly feels just like it should, although I've played a ton of Mario 64 in my life, and the original stick still feels just a bit preferable for me in this case. Overall, though, the stick seems to perform well. It even registers readings beyond the bounds of my best condition official controller, not sure if that's good or bad, and I have no trouble plotting points all throughout its range. Mind you, I'm kind of terrible at Smash Brothers, but I've heard Smash attacks can be trouble with inaccurate sticks. Luckily, the Brawler 64 seems to register Smash attacks just fine. When it comes to the system's occasional D-pad games, well, the D-pad functions just fine, I guess, although being in the secondary position, I can't see a reason to choose it over a regular N64 controller in this case. The Z button has been duplicated into two triggers on both sides of the controller, mimicking your typical current gen setup and allowing you to use whichever side feels better to you. For instance, while in GoldenEye, you'd normally be shooting with your left index finger, here you can shoot with your right index finger and aim with the L button, just like any standard modern shooter. My only complaint here is that the Z triggers are kind of like analog triggers, but of course they aren't. The triggers have a small amount of travel before a Z press registers. Regardless, this is a small complaint for me, and I'm guessing most people probably prefer this soft trigger feel nowadays anyway. Controller pack memory cards and rumble packs can be used through the rear port button, not transfer packs. It's a rather tight fit, and I've seen some plastic dust ground off inside. The clasp thing sort of broke easily on mine and doesn't really hold anything in. But with the tight fit, I'm not exactly concerned about my rumble pack shaking loose anyway. The Retro Fighters Brawler 64 is certainly not completely perfect, but for a fairly reasonable $35, it should sate the desire that people have for a more normal two-handled N64 controller with what I hope might be a more long-lasting stick. I wish we could have compared it to the expensive Hori N64 controllers, but alas, neither of us has one. Luckily, I feel the Brawler 64 fills that void quite nicely, and while I'm unsure how often I see myself choosing it over the classic feel of the original, I might be surprised. I'll try to keep it in mind for the next time I play another N64 game that's new to me. As someone who cares very little for the N64 controller, the Brawler seems like just the thing for me. It fits exactly the kind of controller I've wanted for the N64 without breaking the bank on one of those Hori pads. Of course, the N64 controller is, in my opinion, a very flawed piece of hardware. But most official Nintendo controllers don't really need an upgrade like this. It takes some serious guts to think you can do better than the standard Super NES pad. Of course, that didn't stop a load of competitors from thinking they could do it better. Like the comically oversized Angler from Bishu which takes everything you love about the SNES controller and imagines, what if Fisher-Price made a Super Nintendo pad? Bishu was a company that I was mainly familiar with via a commercial on the How to Score More Points in Video Games tape in our Video Game VHS Tapes episode. When you play all day, you need a stick that's comfortable and stands up to a lot of gameplay. That's why I like the Ultimate Remote from Bishu. Skip Rogers certainly seemed to be a fan. Based on what I could find in a quick internet search is that Bishu filed for bankruptcy in 1995, and the Angler might just be their last controller. The overall form factor of this thing makes it seem like it was made for toddlers compared to the original, with pastel colors and giant buttons. Maybe the angle, haha, -ha, is that this is supposed to be the controller that you let your kid brother or sister use. Taking a number of cues from the ASCII SNES pad, which was one of the few controllers that could hang with the basic controller. You've got rapid fire for each of the face buttons, and pushing the switch a notch further enables auto fire. Below that is a slow motion toggle, which has two levels of strength. Slow and super slow. Super slow is probably the one you want though, because you might have a tough time registering your inputs if the game is pausing and unpausing too slowly. Strangely, I could not get this pad to work with the Super NT, although I'm not really sure it matters all that much. Info on this controller is fairly sparse overall, but I can't say that you're really missing much with this one. Get the power to move with the Acclaim wireless remote for your Nintendo Entertainment System. The Acclaim remote gets you mobile in a WrestleMania grudge match. Flying Airwolf. The Acclaim Remote's Rapid Fire mode means higher scores per mission. In the battle for Iron Sword, seconds count. 
so you need a controller with a look and feel you already know. Accurate up to 30 feet. The official wireless remote controller licensed by Nintendo, created by Acclaim. Get the Acclaim remote, the power to move. There was a time when using a wireless controller was way more of a hassle than it was worth. When Nintendo's wireless WaveBird for the GameCube arrived in 2002, it changed the game. These days, many smaller companies have been striving to provide options for those that would like to cut the tether to their older consoles. The most well-known of these is 8BitDo, whose wireless receivers and wireless controllers for the original Nintendo and Super Nintendo have become the de facto standard by which all others are judged. The SN30 is their take on replicating the Super NES controller. This wireless Bluetooth controller feels just like the original, right down to the texture of the plastic. The SN30 line was updated alongside the release of the Super NT from Analog, with a bunch of different options for color and buttons. While I prefer to opt for the concave X and Y buttons that was typical for the official US controllers, many prefer the convex style of the European and Japanese controllers. Recently, 8BitDo released the SN30 GP series, which takes a page out of Nintendo's handbook and offers a bunch of color choices. These are modeled after five colors of the Game Boy Pocket, which explains the GP in the product name, I guess. 8BitDo sent us a complete set of these controllers so that we could show them here in this video. Externally, besides the colors and the logo change, they feel just as spot on as before. Button designs have been tweaked a little bit to match the feel of the Game Boy Pocket, but when it comes down to it, these are essentially the same as the models released with the Super NT, right down to the micro USB port to charge. All these controllers can be used with the previous mentioned retro receivers, as well as on mobile phones, PC, Mac, and the Switch. There's a handy quick sync guide on the back of the controller if you need to change modes. Response time, interference, and distance has never been a problem with these pads, and the trend continues here. This is probably due to the use of Bluetooth as opposed to 2.4 GHz wireless. Much has been made about D-pad sensitivity with 8-bit DOS controllers. The original SN30 and N30 pads have especially had issues with diagonals. Although my original SN30 had problems, the new revision seems to go a long way to clearing this up. But, and this is a big but, these new controllers have nowhere near the wear and tear that my original had. So I guess it could develop over time. I saw a suggestion online that said to put hole punch reinforcement labels around each input on the PCB as a way to tighten things up. So I gave it a shot. And you know what? It made a big difference in my original pad. I had to layer two reinforcements on top of each other per pad to get the best results. So if you're having issues with sensitivity in your 8-bit DOE controller, this extremely simple mod is worth at least a try. While these controllers can be used with a switch, their lack of buttons doesn't exactly make them an optimal choice. Enter the SN30 Pro. This wireless controller takes the general form factor of a SNES controller and makes it fully functional for the Switch, which I've used mine for constantly since I got it. I have an original release version, but there has been an update on the overall look in recent months, bringing it in line with 8BitDo's current branding. 8BitDo also sent me an updated version for this video. The Pro features are numerous. The dual analog sticks are smooth and feel perfectly normal. They're more akin to the look and feel of an Xbox One controller. And I really like how the four shoulder buttons fit on top of the controller. They don't feel too tightly spaced and are easy to quickly feel out. This is probably the best configuration of four shoulder buttons I've seen on a retro style pad to date. The home and share buttons are what really makes this controller great for the Switch. At first I was a little bit nervous about the placing of these, thinking that I would accidentally hit them regularly, but that's never happened once. And these things even include force feedback. I had no idea that this was going to be a feature. Of course, this is just straight up regular rumble though, so none of that newfangled HD rumble. Alas, much like the SN30 controllers, the D-pad issue does supposedly persist with these as well. Although, to be honest, I really haven't noticed it as severely with the Pro, so it's possible I either got lucky, or I just haven't played the right games for it to be a problem. There's so much good stuff to play on the Switch, where the SN30 Pro makes sense, and I can't wait to play more games with it. Of course, these are fully equipped to work with all games on the system, so even stuff like Zelda, Ease 8, and Bayonetta are playable. So there's something here for all Nintendo fans out there. While the D-pad issues can make things a bit more challenging at times, 
8-Bit Doe has done a great job with these. The Pro Controller is especially great. Sony's DualShock series are among the most popular controllers of a more modern lineage, but I have to admit that it took many, many years for me to finally warm up to them and decide that, yeah, they're actually pretty great. But back in the PS2 era, I was still a bit meh on the DualShock, which is probably why I was surprisingly receptive to the idea of an unofficial PS2 controller. When I visited my cousin and first tried out the Logitech Cordless Action Controller for PS2, I couldn't quite believe that I was actually considering buying an unlicensed controller. The shape of the handles wasn't quite what I was used to, but it wasn't bad. The buttons are more rounded and the sticks, while a bit flatter on top, still have a good grip and are of similar tightness to the DualShock 2. The shoulder buttons are fine and it even has rumble. The only real sticking point is the D-pad, which is hardly an optimal design, but it worked well enough for selecting in Final Fantasy XI, so I didn't really care. It seems passable enough for side-scrolling games, but to be fair, that generation of gaming was probably the most barren overall for 2D gameplay, so I hardly think it's a deal breaker. It seems crazy to think back on, but this was the controller that I played a significant portion of the PS2's most iconic titles with. Well, not this exact one. I had a pair of black ones that I wish I didn't get rid of. I ran across this silver one at a local shop, and I believe its shape and functionality is exactly the same. I was certainly a fan of Logitech's PC accessories at the time, and while they've never been a major player in the console scene, I think they did an excellent job here. I don't recall changing the dual AA batteries very often, but I can't say for sure I remember what the battery life is really like. Any lag that might be introduced by the wireless design has certainly gone unnoticed by me, and I absolutely never experienced any interference, unlike the GameCube WaveBird controller, which was sometimes great and sometimes not, depending on where I lived at the time. You can even use the wireless controller on a PS1, although it's clearly not designed for it since you can't fit a memory card into the slot above the receiver. But these days, I'm definitely a big DualShock fan. It's strange to remember that at one point it felt so strange to me, while the Logitech was what I associated with the PS2 for so many years. I don't really see myself going back to it, but it certainly does a great job for what it is. I was surprised to discover when buying this used one that there is also an Xbox cordless precision controller by Logitech, which I absolutely had to try. It seems of similar quality to the PS2 one at a glance, but my Xbox is currently out for some repairs, so I'll just have to give it a go some other time. Of course, wireless is now standard in the current generation of gaming, but the downside is that the controllers have just become so stupid expensive. I mean, 70 bucks for a Switch Pro controller? 60 for PS4 and Xbox One controllers when they aren't on sale? I couldn't blame you for wanting to go back to wired controllers. Power A seems to be one of the most common brands in the third-party accessory market these days, lying store shelves with an assortment of multi-theme controllers for Switch and Xbox One. These wired versions tend to cost half as much or even less than the wireless first-party counterparts. They seem to generally be officially licensed, so at that price I thought it was worth trying a few to see if they might serve as a passable Player 2 controller for whenever a local multiplayer opportunity might arise. This is the Power A Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild themed Switch controller, and it cost me $25. Despite having a detachable USB cable, this can definitely only be used as a wired controller. The first thing I noticed after unboxing it was that it already had two small nicks on the front from the factory. Not cool if you're looking at these as collectible accessories to your favorite Switch games. The second thing I noticed is that the analog sticks are comically huge. They just have a bizarrely broad diameter and absolutely zero grip in the middle. The ridged edges feel fine and prevent your thumb from slipping off, but right away I could tell that these would not be among my favorite sticks. And the worst part about that is that this controller does not have any gyro controls and thus you have to really put these weird sticks to use to make up for the lack of gyro aim compensation. If you were to ask me and my gyro aiming loving self, that absolutely makes the Power A controller a no-go for Splatoon 2. 
and those gyro only abilities in Mario Odyssey that you don't really have to do and probably should have been assigned to a button, but they're actually kind of nice, so you use them anyway? Nope, can't do them. And you should also know that there's no rumble. Otherwise, the buttons and triggers actually all feel surprisingly nice. The D-pad has kind of sharp edges, but works okay enough. With my Pro Controller and Joy-Cons, this is definitely going to be a dead last pick for local Switch multiplayer, but as long as motion controls aren't required, I suppose it'll get the job done. This, on the other hand, is Power A's wired controller for Xbox One, also officially licensed. After using the Power A Switch controller for a bit, these analog sticks feel downright luxurious. They're similar in resistant size and style to the first party Xbox One controller, concave and textured around the edges. There's a sort of ridge before the textured area, which doesn't feel wonderful, but overall this isn't a bad start for a $30 controller. The buttons and triggers are perfectly decent, while the D-pad is significantly less rough around the corners compared to the Switch controller. The textured back is an appreciated touch, less fine than Microsoft's controller, but not bad all the same. This controller also has no rumble, but at least it's not missing a crucial system feature like gyro on the Switch. More recently, we've spotted a Power A Xbox One controller on store shelves that appears to have a more first party like shape, but similar sticks and buttons to the one I have, with the addition of a pair of rear buttons like Microsoft's Elite controller. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the Power A controller for Xbox One, and pretty disappointed with the equivalent controller for Switch. I won't be adding Power A to my trusted brands list anytime soon, but when they get it right, or at least right enough, the price certainly reflects some degree of good value for an extra controller compared to pricey first party controllers. As far as I'm concerned, wireless controllers are one of the greatest modern conveniences in all of gaming. I'm looking forward to the day when I can have close to official quality wireless pads on all of my older consoles. Which reminds me. So what about the Sega fans out there? Enter Crix, the engineer responsible for the EverDrive line of flash carts. He clearly saw an untapped potential for wireless controllers on the Sega Genesis, and his attempt to fill this much needed gap resulted in the joys. This six button, rechargeable 2.4 gigahertz wireless controller that works on both the Genesis and the Master System is available in two colors, a smoky transparent and plain old black. The Joys sells for a steep $65 on StoneAgeGamer.com and directly from Crix at Crix.com. Crix provided this regular black version so it could be included in this episode. Probably my favorite thing about the Joys is its generally perfect adherence to the design and feel of the original Genesis six button controller which is actually my go-to controller on the system. Despite being a touch heavier, it feels just like the original pad. If it didn't have Crix's name on the controller, I'd be convinced that it was an official first-party product. Early production units had a slightly angled D-pad, which caused issues for some people. Our friend the 8-Bit Duke went pretty deep into this issue. Thankfully, this flaw was remedied in the production runs following the initial batch. The Joys touts a 2.7 milliseconds of response time, which is negligible. I was able to do flips in Revenge of Shinobi 100% of the time that I intended. While a wired controller may have even faster response time, I think you'd be hard pressed to really feel a difference here. You just plug the accompanying receiver into the console and turn it on. If for some reason it doesn't sync, press the button on the receiver and hold X, Y, and Z and the mode button on the controller till it kicks in. There's no LED indicators on the pad itself, so you'll have to keep an eye out for the status by the red LED on the receiver part itself. The Joys uses a micro USB to charge, with its battery supposedly lasting around an insane 150 hours. It switches to a low power rest mode after a few minutes of no inputs. Kind of like how the Xbox One controller achieves its admirable battery life. The wireless signal seems pretty good, although I did have occasional hiccups and momentary loss of signal despite being only around 12 feet away from the receiver. I'm not sure how susceptible the Joys is to interference, but based on what I've seen, it definitely can be. There's three different button profiles you can change at any time by holding down different input combinations. 
This is effectively the same as swapping the controller plugged into the system. But you can switch to 3 button mode at any time by holding down the mode button plus start and C. Master System fans aren't left out either, even though the controller will work with most Master System games by default, some do have issues, like this weird infinite falling glitch in Wonder Boy and Monster Land that happens with both Genesis 3 and 6 button pads. Holding down mode plus start and B will switch to Master System mode, which cleans this up quick. I'd much rather use this controller than the original SMS pad. Holding down mode, pressing start and Z will return to 6 button mode. Alternately, it will revert to this mode after you shut down the system. Going forward, I think the chances are pretty high that this will be my main Genesis and Master System controller. Although it's definitely a bit expensive overall, I think you'll feel the same if you end up with one yourself. When Street Fighter 2 came home to consoles, to say it was huge is an understatement but it also ushered in an age of fight sticks and other specialized fighting game controllers. And not just from third parties, even Capcom themselves got involved with the Power Stick Fighter. In addition to this, Capcom also enlisted the help of ASCII to develop the Capcom Soldier 6 button pad, which is a unique attempt to uh, joystick eyes a control pad. The Soldier pad is one weird looking controller, composed of a vertical grip with a D-pad on top and a platform for the six buttons. There's certainly never been anything quite like this since. Despite my initial hesitation, I felt like this thing handled way better than it looked. It felt unnatural at first, but once you get over the fact that you're holding this like a joystick and adjust to the form factor, then it just works. The ergonomic grip helps a lot. Of course, this controller was meant for Street Fighter 2, and it performed as expected, but if you played a lot of arcade games, it feels pleasantly natural with those, too. For some of the more typical styled console games, though, I'm not sure if this is the best choice. I guess the big question mark with this thing is how does it and your hands hold up during extended play? My hand did start to cramp up after a bit, but that just might have been because it wasn't used to holding a controller like this. Regardless, this is a unique device, and I'd say you can do much worse. <laughs> When I was a kid, I remember seeing advertisements in magazines for a control pad that instead of using a physical D-pad, it had touch sensors. Wow, that sounds awful, is what I thought at the time. Actually, yeah, that's what I think now too. The controller in that ad was this right here, the TurboTouch 360 from Triax Controls, which more than 25 years later, I now own for some reason. So let's open it up, check out what's inside, and see if my 14-year-old instincts were right. A lot of big promises are made on the back of the box. Faster movement, and most importantly, no more blisters or... <laughs> but it was the guarantee inside that had me scoffing. Triax had such confidence in this technology that if you didn't have higher scores within 30 days, you could get your money back. The TurboTouch 360 is designed to the tried and true three button Genesis pad form factor. My first impression was just how light it was. No need for an actual D-pad meant that there are a lot less parts inside. The rapid fire switches put the turbo in the touch and work as expected. But it's a 360 that we're here for, so let's try that out. Booting up Sonic, I was initially surprised by how not bad this is. The touchpad is concave on the face of the controller, which isn't the greatest for comfort. But sensitivity seems nice and responsive. Not bad for early 90s tech, if I do say so myself. Then I tried out some other games, and things started to go downhill quickly. The touch controls may in fact be a little bit too sensitive, meaning that unless you're perfectly precise, then you're going to be hitting some diagonals accidentally. Often. Platformers are one thing, but what about games that allow for 8 directional movement? This is where the Turbo Touch fell apart completely. There seems to be some serious input response lag, which becomes apparent when you move in circles or you need to weave in between bullets. This is also a problem with brawlers, like Streets of Rage. You might find yourself constantly walking forward at a downward slope, but really it's the delayed response that makes it annoying. It almost feels like you're not even in control at all. The intent with this controller was coming from a good place, but despite Triax's belief, this was not the right product at the right time. The Turbo Touch is an inspired experiment, 
but no way are my scores going to improve with this thing. Now, who do I talk to about that refund? Whether it's old controllers for old consoles, new controllers for old consoles, or current gen, whether they're just an expensive alternatives to official controllers, legitimate upgrades over first party, or, well, just stupid, <laughs> there are a ton of third party controllers out there. And we can't possibly have all of them on hand to look at today. And I'm sure we've overlooked a few favorites, but if nothing else, we've been surprised a few times. You never know when something a bit different has the potential to be a new favorite. 